For this session, I'd like to introduce uh, two of my colleagues who always have interesting and hopefully uh, positive but controversial things to say. Remember, the idea is to, for us during these sessions is to try to question, to think about the assumptions we make. So, Raffaella Tanconi, who I can introduce, who's founder and managing director of ADA Economics and also chief economist at uh, Wood and & Company. Um, and she says she doesn't have to be in London anymore for that, so thanks, thanks to COVID for that. Uh, and next to her is uh, my good friend, uh, Pavel Hanat, uh, from the University of Economics here in Prague. Um, Pavel is an expert on the world economy. Uh, he, he follows a huge range of interest um, over the time I've known him. Um, but is essentially looks, tries to make sense of the, how the thing works as a whole. Would that, would that be approximately correct? So, if, if I may start, what, what I'd like to do is to take a couple of themes that seem to be emerging from where we are and to try to get their contributions to begin to weave some kind of narrative in that we can think about and hopefully take away from the day and a half here. So, um, one of the things that struck us, Roman and I, we were talking about this, was, was given the fact that you know, we're, we're talking about this in terms of Asia, what would a European strategy or policy on Asia look like? What, or China look like? Is, is there anything specific that Europe needs to do what are the questions that we need to think about in this new world that Parag uh, ably explained to us? So can I ask Rafaela to go first? Yes, so thank you very much for the invitation. Um, to be honest, I think that if you're thinking about strategic sovereignty in Europe, the most important ingredient to me would be ideology in the sense that Europe is trying to compete with Asia, and China in particular, as well as the US, with the same growth models of these two powers. But it doesn't have the same comparative advantage. Um, and that, to me, is the biggest uh, critical element of it. Now, of course, if you're talking about strategic sovereignty, then I can regurgitate what I have seen in uh, policy papers at the European Parliament and those largely talk about defense and energy and of course you mentioned before batteries and, and things like that. I think those largely miss the point because what you have to understand is that we are at the beginning of this massive digitalization wave, right? And digitalization is 10 times more than just we are going to buy an electric car and we're going to measure the climate impact it's going to have impact on the way economies are run, on financial markets, and on humans. So the human part in particular is the one that I think is the least understood and least prioritized. And, and the financial part is, is still all in evolution. So what I'm mentioning this because it appears to me that Europe wants to be a big power because it has a lot of population, and it has still some of the biggest and wealthiest companies out there. Relative to China, it's still slightly bigger, not as big as the US. And so it wants to replicate exactly that model. It tries to support large companies because they're more efficient. And it believes that this is the way to keep dominance. And as long as you can keep certain supply chains and the energy flowing, that will guarantee the, you know, the solution. And it's completely missing the point. The first point is that Europe, compared with the other two, structurally has significantly more capabilities and dependence on small and medium companies. Now, you could argue that they don't necessarily and they shouldn't be four people's worker like they are in Italy for traditional. Maybe they should move to 20. Fine they're still minuscule, and they will never be in the scale of China. And we haven't even integrated India yet, by the way. So it doesn't have the population size and the industrial structure to really do that. 
And the second thing is, Europe is a political project, and that is its strength and its value. And I think every European citizen, and it's not that I, th I think, I see it in the opinion polls, people like Europe because of its values. It's peace, it's social democracy, rights for everyone, even though we don't fully agree on what is the rule of law, but we know we tend to agree that there is a law and there is fairness. And by imposing this industrial structure that it doesn't fit, the majority of people, because remember, small and medium companies employ at least 50% of people. And small and medium companies are tremendously important for investment, for training, for wage pressures, and for freedom. I mean, now that I'm an entrepreneur, I can see that my contribution is not just that I have the freedom of being in Italy and not in London if I want to, but I can train an enormous amount of workers. And yes, I don't pay them very much because my balance sheet is small, but I nourish them to the max. I give them responsibility. I stimulate them because that's when they pay off for me. And large multinationals don't do that because that's not their edge, they come in the second wave. So I think Europe is completely missing the backlash, economic backlash and political backlash that is coming through this inadequate structure and it's where is the seed of its own demise actually. So I think if it could just stop looking at everyone else and try to just look inside, it would believe that this is its edge. Because again, digitalization means human capital, means people need to be creative, they need to trust statistics, um, they have the energy to think, by the way, you know, they, they need to have the freedom to question. And neither the US nor China have an edge on this. You know, structurally, they don't. The US has invested too little in education for too long, and now you really see it. I mean, I don't know whether you've seen there, like hundreds of people showing up thinking that JFK is coming back at 104 years old. <laughs> you know, I mean, there is a level of misinformation that I, I don't think you can come back from. So I think that's, yeah, that would be my answer. That's, that's really interesting, isn't it? So Europe should stop worrying, number one, focus upon what we do well, which means recognizing what we do well vis-a-vis -vis other forms of capitalism, let's say, global capitalism, and then just get on with it. Okay? So, that gives you a little bit of a challenge there, Pavel. <laughs> uh, it's quite tempting for me to say, let's move to the dinner, because I think the most important thing was just said. This is the recipe, what the Europe Czech Republic has to do. I mean, to answer your original question, I would stress to have a strategic vision, to do something strategically, we first must have the strategy in the first place. We must know what we are. We must know what we would like to achieve. And I feel, and it was pretty in line with what Rafaela said, that in Europe we don't. We are still struggling, and I don't mean just struggling in between states and struggling in between institutions, but also we are struggling in what's the most important achievement Europe, Europe did. And uh, I mean, everything was said, so I only want to add one more concept. European integration is globalization. What Europe is at the moment is because of globalization. So if China wants to look ahead and say globalization is not that important for us, if America tries to push the world without actually needing globalization, Europe can't because globalization is in the very DNA of the European integration project. So our option definitely must be different from the Chinese and from the American one. It must be purely European and it must come from what citizens, small and middle-sized enterprises need and want. And some things are quite easy. I mean, let's make our governments digital. Let's teach them to speak effectively with their citizens. Let us enable all the cross-border movements. It was already mentioned here. And I really liked when, when Parag was talking about infrastructure. And in, in that sense, even though COVID is, is a terrible disaster, I see an opportunity in it too, that now we are much more sensitive to all the infrastructure we were missing all those years. 
when you want to switch your classes online in three days, then you realize that there is no high-speed internet connection at all. <laughs> if you have your family in hospital, then you realize that it was not invested enough in hospitals. Highways, everything. So uh, COVID is something which has started fear in people and where people are afraid they will want to see the infrastructure investment which on the other hand of course is costly for the societies. It's, it's interesting we already have some agreements so <laughs> Martina would you like to? I, um, I don't want to sound like um, um, a devil's advocate uh, because uh, I'm basically representing um, um, the, the liberal approach to our trade policy. Um, but uh, if you look at what is happening on the global scene, you have two big players basically playing according to their rules. Um, I'm a strong transatlanticist. So again, uh, I may sound like basically putting China and the US on the same side, but, um, but if you certainly understand what I mean. You have China, you have the US, and, and no matter what distinction we make between these two players, uh, the fact is that, that the US plays uh, uh, according to its rules as well. Um, so where it actually um, leaves the EU as a major trading bloc, um, we are lagging behind on innovation, we're lagging behind on technologies, we are even lagging behind on uh, enforcing the uh, global trade rules. We are lagging behind the fact that, uh, that China, uh, no matter what, uh, you know, um, does not um, uh, does not even show readiness to move uh, as it was generally expected after China joined the WTO that it would start slowly but surely play according to the rules. So. Uh, this is the, uh, the response to this situation is the concept of the strategic autonomy. When France is basically telling us, other member states, uh, the liberal free traders, that we are too naive. And this is in every discussion we have with the French, they start, let's don't be naive, you know, and let's start uh, think strategically. And that is the response, this, this concept, um, to, um, to uh, tackle the current issues and challenges in a more rational, more smarter way, as the French would put it. But the fact is that we are, as uh, the, the whole like-minded countries, uh, really advocating the free trade, as it was the case in the past, that we are um, in defense in a strong defense. So that, that was my comment to what you were saying, that, uh, that it's not only about uh, the SMEs, as I understand your logic, you know, but uh, this is basically the political response to what is happening. I, I, mean, I think absolutely you're, you're making a, a very good point. And of course, it's not just about the SMEs. And I think, I mean, perhaps naively of me, I. You know, if, if the U.S. puts sanctions left, right, and center, of course, it's normal that the EU should also do that. Um, but that, I don't think that is a lack of strategy, is a lack of foreign policy coordination, I would say. But what I mean to say is that I think Europe has more strength than it realizes, even when you talk about technology. Because actually, when I look at the US, I mean, I, people talk to me about innovation all the times, and it's true, there is a phase where there is innovation. But right now, technology is not really that much about innovation, it's about oligopoly. Where are all the big techs? In the US, they have the data, they have the market penetration, and they use it. That's not innovation right and that because with the digitalization you're essentially creating oligopolies at the global scale so you're fiddling with humans capacity to process risk through overloading of information and you're fiddling with competition 
then this equilibrium is not one that is desirable for anyone. So in that respect, I think that Europe can still surprise if it starts from the basics. And I think starting from the SME's point of view forces you to look at the questions differently. You know, if the structure of Europe was like Russia, which is not dissimilar from the US and not dissimilar from China, then of course the only thing that you want to do is to grow bigger and bigger and bigger faster. But now what I see is that, first of all, we're stuck in this world of QE and digital penetration. And all of this liquidity and bad information is feeding distrust. And distrust as a cost. So I think you were talking about complexity before. And, and I think your point was absolutely correct. But from where I sit, I find that sometimes you focus too much on complexity and you lose sight of the good points of experience. So for example, let's talk about financial stability and the cost of capital and inflation, right? I mean, to me, the more people distrust what is going on, and you have no idea how many conversations I have on a daily basis that prove to me that we are beating distrust. And distrust means people try to leave mainstream. Try, you know, they don't buy euros, they buy dollars because they don't trust the euro. They don't buy neither euros, nor dollars, nor houses. They buy bitcoins. I mean, there are many ways of expressing that distrust, which brings back, it will eventually cost in terms of cost of capital, it will cost in terms of inflation because of lack of competition. So the amplitude of that financial cost is many, many more times bigger, I think, than fiddling with questions about exactly how you align your sovereign uh, strategy, if that, if that makes sense. I would also maybe add one thing that arises from economics textbooks. There is a difference between short and long run. And of course, in the short run, we will have to follow the rules of the others. But if it is the strategy to overcome this in the long run, then we must mil build the, the basics of, of the future prosperity. And also, uh, reaction to this complex world, I mean, it's Shakespeare who says that the simple, simple truth is not simplicity. So there are simple answers. You have, as a, as a representative of our government, you have named the problems we have in Europe. It's, it's a wonderful thing. If we know the problems, let's face them. It could have been much worse. We could, we could be in the situation that we are not even aware of them, but we know them. We know them very well. So it's a wonderful starting point. And if I quote another dear friend of mine, Dr. Takur Weigold, she, she lives in Switzerland these days, and recipe for everything, she says, is Mittelstand. The, it's the recipe for education. Here it's a disaster if a kid is not entering a university. In Switzerland, parents are proud if he or she starts a wonderful viable business, even though it's no, no high tech. So it's, it's a remedy for everything. And Europe must realize it and Europe cannot seek for the recipes that are suitable for China and, and America, in my eyes. This, this is really interesting, isn't it? Can I, can I push both of you, and maybe you as well, Martina, just to say, so, okay, we take all these things into consideration. What would be our, 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 our actual policy raft, if you like, our strategy for dealing with the, uh, the emerged superpower that is China, given the various things that you've said. So what would it look like um, from the considerations uh, that, you've, or you, that you've expressed? So perhaps I should have said outright that I am nowhere close to be an expert in foreign policy. But what I would do is, so I'm a big fan in saying that we should invest 10 times more in human capital right now. Yeah. And human capital, for me, it means many things. It starts with maternity. 
and it goes all the way to create power statistical offices and research center at the state level. So let's take the environmental transition, right, and China. So to me, a form of pollution and inflation is the fact that since 2010, so since the last crisis, we have been intentionally shortening the life of goods and services. That is a form of inflation, that is a form of pollution. But we don't measure depreciation, we don't want to measure depreciation, right? So why don't we acknowledge this issue, for example, build the expertise to understand, to evaluate, to measure all of these things, and all of a sudden you would have created good jobs, you would have created more jobs, you would have created a sense of confidence that you actually know how climate change is moving forward, and you would have created a big problem for China and the US, actually, because you, you would have forced them to change some of their production, because China is super strong in very fast but low quality. That's where, because it has very thin margins. So I would say that's the first one. Second one is, and I have a thing for it, I admit, maternity policies. Today, we create more women at higher education level than men across the spectrum. And digitalization wants high skills. It disproportionately benefits people with high skills. So it turns out that we've churned a lot of women at that level, but we have not prepared the labor market so that they can stay in the labor market. So you have all of this talent that you cannot use, and this is just Europe is everyone. So this creates frustration and inefficiency. It also creates another problem that you all live as machines of data processing computers, right? From the moment you wake up, you, you store information, you evaluate it, and your mother, believe it or not, is there as the first trainer of that process. You have to create the conditions so that we do this better, so that people don't show up to the street waiting for JFK to show up at 104 years old. And I think that's because it's a problem of everyone at different stages. Again, it means that if there is global talent out there, and of course I'm talking about women because it is the women that are in the statistic dominant, but it has enormous cascading effects for the children, for the families, the husband, the grandparents, everyone. It's super powerful and very attractive so that we can steal some Chinese talent at zero cost because they want to come and live here or the Americans, you know, they can come and live here. So be smart about it and they don't have a way to offset it, right? We already have healthcare that covers a lot of people. So these would be my first, uh, my first levels. And the third one, but I think that's miles and miles away, is to really, again, invest in understanding about how to measure competition. Because I think competition is like love, it has phases. You cannot just say that this sector has competition and this sector doesn't have competition, not in a globalized, digitalized world. And if you don't do that, all of this QE is just going to be a lot of inflation, I think. This is, this is interesting, isn't it? Because essentially, I guess, from what you're saying, is it Europe's face to the world in this multipolar, multi-civilizational is actually more civilizational than, than the other two, let's just say, because of the essential humanity, potential humanity of, and that's what would mark us out uh, as an in key ingredient for our strategy of dealing with this new power distribution. Yep, Fabio. Uh, I can only underline the investment in human capital. So of course, in the short run, uh, the smart specialization, specialization concepts looking at what we are good at, comparing it what will be needed in the future, and investing in the right way. And even though you got quite excited about Europe 
borrowing money for this, in this case, I think it is quite suitable. Because if you borrow into something that will bring you money in the future, I don't see a problem here. And I don't think that it that much changes the, the structure and, and the potential euro hash. But in the long run, if it's about talent strategy, then and you probably wouldn't expect anything less from a teacher, education education on all levels, the, the lower you are with the education, the more critical it probably is, which definitely also starts with the role of women and the role of families, because I see it very clearly as a university teacher, when we got the kids, they are done already. There's, there's nothing you can truly change on them. You can improve their qualities, you can give them more uh, or better you can make them make some tasks better, but their values, it's, it's all done. It's, it's much sooner. So here in the Czech Republic, everyone complains about, about secondary education, but actually it's a mediocre thing because at the end of it all, as I said earlier, if our kids tell us, I will end my education with secondary level, we see it as a disaster. We see it as we've wasted all the time because why secondary education? It's not that way in all European countries and there is no surprise that Switzerland is the most innovative country of Europe with that strong uh, middle-sized companies and with people actually being proud of being able to run small firms. So education everywhere. And I think we will tackle that issue even later so I will leave it that way. Yeah, I agree. Um, Perhaps you could bring this back to um, continuing the, 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 the idea of there are certain uh, elements which we need to think about in the world that we are now facing. Uh, and one of them uh, seems to be partly accelerated by, certainly in, in the UK where, where, where I live, uh, by COVID, is that the move away from the neoliberal state towards much more intervention, which at a European level suggests an increasing industrial policy, increasing guidance, and of course the debate at the moment in terms of supporting certain sectors, this phrase that we talked about earlier on strategic sovereignty, we needn't use that if you don't want to, but <clears throat> what do you think about this idea emanating increasingly from the Commission and from the Council of Ministers that what Europe actually needs to do? partly to achieve this balance between, you know, in this triumvirate, but also because to kick-start the recovery, the build back better, we need industrial policy. Uh, Pask, start with you. Uh, maybe the first small remark, I really see COVID as an accelerator. I, I don't see a trend or a thing that wouldn't be here before COVID. I only see things being amplified by COVID in our personal lives, in micro level, in macro level. So in that sense, also the, uh, let's say, a renaissance of the industrial policy, it was here before. COVID definitely makes the pressure much, much bigger. I would say that in my eyes, the industrial policy that is now returning is very different from the one we have left. Mm -hmm. And there was a reason why we left it and let it be in, in, the, in the history. If monetary policy did the same, it would be wonderful. So the new industrial policy, which is more interventionist on a micro level rather than macro level, I don't think it's bad. And if you realize how the world actually works and that we are talking about competition, about oligopolies, about monopolies on transnational corporations level, I mean, all the neoclassical ideas about economics, they simply work with the assumption of perfect competition because we trust yeah. in the market that much. But the more you dig into how transnational corporations, how, how the Everyone loves value chains, but how they actually work, it's about, it's about monopolistic power. It's no uh, perfect competition at all. So in that respect, I don't think that it must be bad. We must have smart industrial policies. And again, it's very hard to bridge the difference between long run and short run. And it's similarly hard to bridge the difference between microeconomics and macroeconomics. I mean, 
even the way how we teach students in economics, we start with microeconomics because it seems easier, and then completely detached, we at macroeconomics. But it's, it's, the, it's two, two sides of the same coin. So if it is the way how we can bridge micro and macro division, then why not? What, what about the idea of European challenges? You know, creating, suspending competition rule, so, and identifying certain in inverted commas, key sectors, mm. so you create, again, in inverted commas, a, a European challenger, in other words, a challenger for the global market mm. or global sector mm. and technology mm. or something. Um, they even have the key enabling technologies, right? That's the idea I quite like because it does not only speak about the current situation, but it tries to foresee the future Martin Tlapa was the first one in, his, in this country who started to talk about foresight. So it's not about forecasting. They may fail. They may all fail. But there is some feeling that these technologies can be the enablers of the, of the future change. And the Commission is pushing this through. It's the smart specialization com concept built upon the key enabling technologies. So yeah, I really feel that there might be something on it. But as usual, fail fast. If it does not work, let's leave them as quickly as we can, because it's very European that once you start doing something, you keep doing something, and that's not suitable for and, this And world. the EU doesn't have a good track record in recognizing its mistakes, of course. Yeah. So, Rafael, how, how do you feel about you know, this whole topic and creating European global challenger industries and leaders? And I think I'm going to disagree now, <laughs> just to stir things up. <laughs> Um, look, of course, some industrial protection makes sense, but uh, the idea of the European superpower is very much a French one, right? And in as much as I think the French are probably a little bit more honest than the Italians, I think it's a little bit. So if sometimes you want to go and find some geeky statistics about the EU, I urge you to look at the financial accounts of non-financial corporations. And there you will find that the country that is most leveraged and honestly quite puzzling is France. The non-financial corporations in France are hugely indebted and ultra-rich. Something doesn't quite add up. So what they've done, because the French are supremely good at maths, as soon as they got the euro, they figured the interest rates would be low and they leveraged to the max. They had the capacity to do it properly and they did. They did very successfully. Although my experience tells me that when certain ratios are so far out of line in international experience, including the Americans, something doesn't quite work out. So uh, they clearly have an incentive of trying to create uh, global powers. But again, in my experience, every time you create an oligopoly, a monopoly, or somebody that is just too big relative to everybody else, sooner or later, you get really bad service. And really bad service, when you created a, country, a company that is that big, it means that millions of people and entities will be held back. I mean, you know why the Italians don't have internet? They just discovered the internet. It's because for 15 years, all of the electricity and communication companies, they couldn't care less. They were full of cash. I mean, what is this actually building the infrastructure? Who cares? You know, I mean, so, no, I, I, I completely disagree in, uh, in strategy. I don't think it's going to yield anything, really, than what you could get in a much fairer, more innovative, more sustainable way than just try to innovate in some other way. So you think it, it, the, the, the initiative builds in uh, financial, uh, huge financial issues, one, and it also builds in long-term uncompetitiveness? Yes. I mean, you may be creating an entity that can compete globally, but what you're not considering is how many distortions are you generating on the way back. And plus, who is going to pay when something goes wrong? Because something will go wrong. Because when you have that kind of scale, eventually something goes wrong. And, and perhaps it's good to clarify a bit. Because when, 
When I mention SMEs, people think that, you know, I'm trying to protect the huddly cuddly, right? 10 employees, you know, 100,000 turnover, and then you have Alibaba and, you know, of course, what you're talking about. There are degrees of effective competition and no competition. And I think if you ask, in fact, one of the first surveys that I run was in the Czech Republic, where I went around entrepreneurs and said, what is the scale of your competitor that you would consider fair game? You know, is your competitor twice as big as you, 10 times as big as you, 100 times as big as you? Most entrepreneurs say, it's fair game. You know, I don't care. My, my competitor is 100 times bigger, I'm faster. Because every entrepreneur is egocentric, right, to some extent. But today is peculiar because so to give you a sense, a large company in Europe, so that would be classified as 250 employees, right, would have a turnover, that let's call it 500 million. That's your stat data. 500 million in turnover. But you know that today global revenues of some of the biggest companies are 500 billion, right? So how can you think that it's real competition? That's global market power. So when we talk about competition, let's try to be clear that it's not that you're trying to really generate something inefficient. You're just trying to stop the fact that you're skewing the, the distribution that consistently goes right and too far right. And also, since we have policymakers, uh, on the audience. Beware of the marriages that that bring, because we're used to thinking averages, because, right, you think that the population is largely represented within a certain interval. So your average makes sense. But if your economy is so unequal that it skews to the right, so that riches get richer and richer and richer, your average is moving up, so you think you're getting richer, but actually, that's not, picture, it's not picking up anything because 90% of the entities are this way. So then you have a real policy problem that you actually don't know what's going on in the company or the country. And, you know, turns out that's, <laughs> that's true. That's true. Interesting. Any further remarks? Uh, to just remind me, one? like, a few years ago, I visited the IMF Spring meetings, and there was a roundtable of the chief economist, and he was still advocating globalization, telling differences among nations decrease, but differences within nations do increase, which is pretty in line with what you've just said. And I think there is another pressure. Not only we don't know what is the current situation of our economies, but politics is changing largely of this. I mean, no matter whether you take Brexit vote, whether you take German elections, whether you take the Czech elections, these shifts in, in equality, in, in, in how wealth is distributed over our societies will sooner or later challenge our political systems. And that will also be something we should foresee rather than react when it actually happens, because it's already uh, far too late. Well, that's, that's, uh, that's interesting, isn't it? Let's just stay at the European level, uh, if we may, for a, a little bit longer. Y you, there's all kinds of discussions at the moment as, as to the way forward um, in terms of the support and the changes that are taking, taking place. Um, so I want to ask a, a number of questions. Uh, do you think that, that the funds that were voted, um, that we talked about in terms of the euro earlier on, uh, are appropriate? Um, uh, and secondly, uh, how do you see the Czech Republic benefiting? Um, how would you then, how would you like the Czech Republic to, to benefit from that? Um, and also, particularly for, for uh, Raffaella, uh, how do you see this working out at a European level in terms of the 750 billion longer term? Because um, all this gets tied in with the politics of this, obviously. Uh, this leads us to the question of investment. Uh, there have been examples, and even though people 
think this time is different. It never is. History repeats itself and economic history twice that much. So there were examples already that after financial crisis, now I think the Great Recession, not COVID itself, after financial crisis, private investment declines significantly. We have seen it in Japan, we have seen it in Southeast Asia, even though misleadingly we interpreted like increase in savings, it actually was decline in investment, which then leads to what sometimes people call secular stagnation. And when the Great Recession started, I started to speak about this is about to happen in Europe decline in private investment and the strategies how to how to cope with it are well known we can do it as japan did and we will end with 250 percent of gdp to that ratio we will have wonderful super speed trains everywhere but it won't save us so this is something which won't work the other thing is that we can borrow, we can distribute the money among the European nations with some guidelines, but as we've already tackled, Europe works as it works. So even though there are gu guidelines, the way how the money actually ends, no one knows. And in Czech education, we already have the programs started, they are already offered. Czech universities can already apply to this part of the money. And I see it, how it ends. Everyone, the buzzword now is online, so everything will be digital and online, but this is not enough. This is no strategy at all. So from this perspective, I'm quite okay with that amount again, because for me it's not that big. Uh, what kind of scares me is, and it's probably, this is where I actually feel old. I, I can't understand the whole concept of the, of the green policies. I'm too afraid of the unintended consequences of them that I can't believe that they can work. And in my eyes, Europe needs private investment, not necessarily green state-enforced investment. So in my eyes, it's about private companies always more creative, always more innovative, always more effective in allocation of investment. Once it's government, no matter how smart it is, telling us where and how to invest, the problem of misallocation is always, is always there. I think that's a really in interesting point. That, that's certainly the conclusion of the, uh, uh, of the UK in investment agency, that, that 95 to 96% of the funding for quote unquote the green revolution must come from private investment because it's risk again, innovation again, and also because it links directly with the point that Raphael was making with people's own lives. You know, money from the government seems to come from <laughs> above. <laughs> Raphael, I would. Um, well, I would say that the problem that I have, or rather the problem that I see with uh, the recovery fund and then the EU budget is that there is too much earmarking, in my view, to really end up being efficiently allocated. And of course, I understand why earmarking is there, because then otherwise it's not coordinated, and then the Germans wouldn't trust the Italians, the French, the Poles, and, and it's like that. But in reality, it means that you end up pushing a lot of investment with a cyclical boost, largely in infrastructure and a few capital investments. And you don't really end up doing, especially the digital and intellectual capital. So for example, the thing about, um, we don't talk about digitalization, is we've, we, we all rushing to put all of the public services online, right? But the truth is that you would in some countries, it makes sense if you just generate a platform that gives visibility to local services and sellers. Because one of the biggest challenges when you are small, and now I'm talking about real small, right? I'm the sole entrepreneurs or the baker or whatever it is, the, the, the girl with the boutique of clothes in little city number X, is that they lose visibility in a digital world. 
you know, their business model was based on the fact that everybody knew them by reputation and therefore used their services. In digitalization, it doesn't work unless you're sufficiently digitally present and the cost of being digitally present is expensive the more people are digital. So it appears to me that there is space for creating the equivalent of motorways in real life, motorways in digital life, or rather platforms so that the, the small guys really can get visibility. And I think that um, that would be a, a good way of using something akin to the EU money, but it's never going to happen unless you really try to focus on it. Do we, do we have any indication at the moment that this might happen at no. the EU level? No. It's a simple answer. No. <laughs> <laughs> but it's a so, matter of ideas, you know. It's, yeah. it's, it's a pooling of ideas eventually will hit them. But, you know, uh, uh, equipping our, our citizens for uh, 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 a future which is not full of inequality in terms of knowledge and opportunity, that would seem to be a fundamental starting point. You know, as, as we're going to be talking about di digitalization as the key process. Yeah, I, I mean, unfortunately, it seems to me that both digital and climate change, which are very, very complex and long term problems, we try to rush and we pretend that we can solve them in three years. Yeah. But there is no way you can do it. And that's while nice. you try to do that, you just create more distortions. Yeah. Yeah, well, I, that's, that's certainly something I think many people here would, would agree with. Pavel, do you want to? Yeah, I, I just add one thing about this digital platform. There will be a very direct feedback. We have discussed the taxi drivers in Prague. Rafael was asking whether they're better, and I answered no. But then I realized that some of them are. There, where is this direct feedback on driver? And of course, it's all online, and it's because each of us verse in his or her pocket the super speedy computer. If I compare with my first computer with my cell phone at the moment, and I mean, so let's benefit from this. And I see it, I mean, again, our university had to switch online in three days. We were noticed on Tuesday that everything will close, and on Friday we already were lecturing online, because at the end of it all, everyone was equipped, everyone had at least some experience, and even though I do agree that we are all very tired now, now we see that we have managed even the people that were afraid to send an email because they mm. never knew what it can mm. happen, they know that they are capable of teaching online. And this is something we must build upon. And it's very easy to start with the government. They all have the equipment. I, I, think, I know that it's different now. I have been working for the Czech Statistical Office a decade ago. Everyone had a printer on his or her table. Everyone had a computer on his or her table. So they are equipped. It's there. We just must build upon it. D that's really interesting. Um, I'm going to ask Martina to ask another question because she's waving. But before I do, uh, I just make a comment that most of the National Health Service in the UK still depends on fax machines. So um, I think there's somebody. Is there somebody else that I haven't noticed? Thank you. Thank you. All right, thank, uh, sorry, thank you very much. Fascinating discussion. I would have uh, one very practical, concrete question to Pavel, uh, and then some uh, uh, reflection. Uh, you mentioned the mo uh, th that supply chains is uh, a monopoly sort of um, uh, kind of environment. I, I hope I understand what does it mean, but I'm not sure I understand that. So if, if you could elaborate on that, that would be help, helpful for me. And then uh, <clears throat> second, I, uh, the, the, uh, coming to Central Europe, uh, we did a study and, and, and uh, one of the big problems, so three big challenges adding to the sort of German or, or you know, um, uh, dependency is first, you know, if we, we did a comparison between the four Central European countries and, and uh, three uh, benchmark countries, Netherlands, Austria, Germany. And, th and across 7,000 indicators, and three of those stand, uh, stood out. One was the 
the differences in government efficiency, rule of law, and uh, an overall regulatory um, environment. Um, second was the lack of capital in general, domestic capital in Central Europe. It's, it's like it's, it's light years away from the old money that are in the old capitalist <laughs> economies. And um, uh, third, obviously, is the, foreign, is the ownership uh, of the banks. Now, uh, w w when we talk about the second, uh, the first, the efficiency, it, it, it means that it's extremely difficult to translate any even well-thought policy into an impact uh, within Central Europe. Um, so and these three things, in my opinion, are going to stay here. <laughs> in the case of the old money, it might be 100 years, obviously. And uh, in terms of the government efficiency and so on, it's actually declining. So, and why I'm, I'm not saying this because I want to uh, say that everything is, is, is bad around here. What I'm trying to say is that, that these are cars that we're going to play with for at least next 20 to 50 years, maybe forever. <laughs> so, and, and, and in many cases, it, it sort of relates to Europe as such. Um, I, I've just listened to a podcast and, and they asked an American investor, you know, on the grand scale, what is it that you would like about Europe in terms of investment? And obviously there was nothing in tech, there was nothing in... in he, he said, well, Europe is interesting because they have the old luxury brands which are never... which are nowhere in the world, and that's not exactly encouraging. And my question is, uh, do... I mean, and, and you, you sort of have similar argument, but I think that we also should think about some sort of a plan B <coughs> in case that all the grandiose and well-thought plans are not going to work. And I'm skeptical. I, I think we need them because we need some place, some aim. But is there a realization that we don't have good cards dealt? And last point, we did have much better cards about 20 years ago when Nokia was the number one technology uh, and we're nowhere there after 20 years. So we're actually on a downward trajectory. And I would like to hear from someone, and I keep asking this question, is there, is there a thought about plan B? You know, is it, you know, trying to swallow the pride and try once again to look at the United States as, as, as sort of the, the, the natural link for us for the future? Or, or I'm not sure if I'm explaining myself clearly, but once again, we're not in a structurally good position and the structural conditions are not going to change within the next decade. So <coughs> what is the plan B? Is there a plan B? That, that would be the question. Thank you. Uh, so if I may start with what I meant with uh, competition and GVCs, in my eyes, global value chain is about control. It's, it's about ownership. I mean, if you ask Czech businessmen in automotive, are you happy with being part, if, are you happy with being the bloody supplier of the German car producer? They say, well, we have invested 20 years in becoming that. We have improved all our processes. We have met all the German standards. Yes, we are happy. We are not about to change this in the next 20 years because we first need these 20 years to get back. So in that respect, it's no free competition. There is no no barriers to enter. It, that's what I meant in that in that respect. And I think that I can also, I, I don't know the plan B, <laughs> but I, I think that I can also partially answer. <laughs> un <laughs> they know the plan C. <laughs> Uh, I think that this is also part of an answer to, yes, we, we have some things here that we cannot change quickly, but still we are the, lucky, the, luck, the more lucky part of the world. And I, when I prepared for this discussion, I decided that I will mention Susan Strange and that I will mention casino capitalism. Because when I lecture about financial crisis, when I lecture about financial globalization, there is no way how to avoid financial panics. There is no way how to eliminate financial crisis from the world. They will be here and they will simply beat you from time to time. And the weaker you are, the, the more dependent you are, the more often it will happen. And we are lucky if compared with Argentina, Angola and, and many others, even though it can sound cheap, most of the world is, is happier than, than we are. But there is a way how you can make yourself more resilient, how you can eliminate the impacts of these eventualities that will definitely happen. And 
even in financial crisis, similarly as in supply chains, it's about being more flexible, more creative, more innovative, being better. When Bublu speaks about Mittelstand, she, she mentions, uh, Dr. Takur Weigold about Mittelstand, she, she mentions uh, Swiss companies that have their niche market. If the, supply, if, if the smile curve that everyone in supply chain theory knows, if it works, these companies would be non-existent because they don't compete by price, they simply compete by doing something much, 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 much better than anyone else. And this is what the Czech Republic must do. And again, everything starts with education. I mean, when I speak to the auditorium, it's about uh, leaving your comfort zone. It's about trying harder. And I th somehow feel that this has disappeared from Europe. We have lived in our comfort zone for far too long that we actually forgot how to leave it. And it's everywhere. I mean, micro, micro business. Um, I would add, I definitely don't know of any plan B. Um, as for getting closer to the US, I think it's not the right historical time. When I look at the data, to be honest, the glory days of the US are well behind us. They have excruciatingly high sensitivity to equity prices, because you look at their balance sheets, it's very, very exposed to equities. Um, their natural rate of interest, so that the amount of tightening that the Fed can do before it tips into recession, it's certainly less than 200 basis points. So. It's in its structurally it has been declining. So you really have to differentiate the all of everything that is happening in the digital companies which are quoted in the in the stock market from the rest of the economy. The rest of the economy to me is clearly on a downward trend. And you also have to remember that US has no budget control, actually. It can only spend trillions and trillions and trillions when it's in a recession, which, as you said, eventually happens. But in between, it's actually extremely limited by politics. So it also, and you can see it now in their investment bills, that, you know, when it then happens to try to make the jump, they cannot do it. So I think Asia is a significantly more exciting partner. Uh, China, India, you know, if you want, level it up on that front, but I think, to be honest, Asia, the US, of course, will always be a, a geopolitical important partner, but it's not an economic aspiration, I think, yeah. So this, thank you, does that, does that help? Or would you like to push us more? I'm sure we'll come back to this. Uh, you know what, I, wa I meant, <laughs> <laughs> I, I, sorry, I did mean to add that I think, don't underestimate how strong and powerful is the favorable trend that where the Czech Republic is. You're still in the right place of convergence. You are indeed very well run. I mean, I understand nothing is perfect, right? But, you know, the benchmark has dropped, so you're still relatively better. <laughs> So I think for the next 10 or 15 years, this country is still yeah, going to be agree, better. Agree. Yeah. Th this raises, of course, the, the, the whole sort of uh, specter of, the, of the, the geopolitics and the morals. And, and if you're suggesting that uh, um, a preferable, uh, which I agree with, by the way, in many ways, a preferable economic partner would be Asia, specifically China, but the geopolitical partner would be the United States, for obvious reasons that most of us in this room would appreciate. Uh, isn't that potentially contradictory? <laughs> and what kind of issues and weaknesses would that, and positions, would that put the EU, and then consequently the Czech Republic, under? Do you want to? Thanks. I mean, we, we are not foreign policy experts, but I feel that we must understand that we cannot tell China how to behave. 
I mean, we are not in that position and we will not be. I mean, I know that here in the Czech Republic there was a strong commitment of the Havel policies which definitely worked against some kind of interests with China. We know that the Chinese saw this very, very clearly. Now when the government changes, people in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs are again afraid what happens if, if these things return, of, what if we put politics over business, which can happen. But I think that we should realize that we are not in that position. So as was said in the previous panels, we must know very surely what we want from China. We must be very aware of what China can do to us and then we must do business as usual without. So in that respect, I think it could work. Of course, our civilization is America and Europe. That's, that's where we are home. That's what we understand. We can never fully understand. Well, maybe you can, but I will never fully understand China. <laughs> so from this, from this respect, uh, we must realize that it's not it. We cannot tell them how to behave. We are not even sure whether what we recommend to them would at the end be good for us. So from this perspective, business as usual, uh, business first, I would even say. If, if Europe is globalization, then business first. But carefully, because they might be dangerous. That, that's, that's interesting. Raffaello, what, how do you read this? Um, I would say that, um, you know, Germany has such strong and long-term interest in selling cars to China that I don't think we really, we're not even likely to really pick up a fight with China. So I think that solves that. And by Germany, you mean the Czech Republic? No, no, it really <laughs> all starts somewhere else. <laughs> but I mean, in, in terms of, you know, can you, can, uh, beyond that, I think Europe is giving very conflicting signs to the world and its own agreed, citizens agreed, yes. about its own values. So you cannot possibly be credible in, you know, when the EU talks about human rights and the rule of law, when, you know, we don't know what the rule of law is. Yes, we have the paper from the Commission. It's not evident. We don't agree. We, we don't even acknowledge that they're genuine different systems. So I think that's the biggest problem, is not that we have split interest is that we have stopped working hard at what we have created. And I must say, I think years ago, I was so fond of the European model because I thought all of these countries would come in and really confront each other on ideas and this is where you get the best value out of it. But what we settled with is we have deprived each country of intellectual capital, because the central banks are becoming irrelevant, because the Ministry of Finance are becoming irrelevant, and because the politicians only care about agreeing. So there is no intellectual debate. There is the commission, and whatever the commission comes up with, and the commission does exactly the same mistake as the banks. They recruit the same type of people, and they all have to have the same point of view. And so that's not elevating the dialogue, it's decreasing the dialogue. As, and the same thing I notice in the ECB. The ECB is the reflection of the Bundesbank, right? And the Bundesbank said, we don't look at regional dis disparity, we only have one average. Fine, it made sense then, it does not make sense now. So, uh, you know, European project is an intellectual project, well, you need to make the homework. Yeah, it's funny that we have discussed the very same thing <laughs> during the coffee break already. I added that on the top of the commission, there is the parliament, which in many aspects is even worse. At least that's my, that's my point of view. And I think that there is one quote that says it all. Germans are a nation that cannot make small mistakes. And I think that says a lot about where Europe is heading at the, at the moment. So can I add my feminist Please line? <laughs> <laughs> and, but I dare stop you. <laughs> <laughs> Do 
just because I have an agenda here that I want to bring forward. Um, no, but I think, I think this is another positive spillover, giving more genuine visibility to women. They have a different point of view, they have a different interest. You structurally just sparkle a little bit of a different point of view. We're not saying that one is better and one is not. We're just saying it's different. You, the system needs difference. And that, I think, is a big pickle in the European project. The single market and this necessity of standardizing everything, I think that may also be an issue by now, because you have eliminated a lot of the genuine ability for the newcomers to innovate. For innovation, yeah. I think we're coming to almost a natural uh, end to the session, but I just wondered uh, if there were any other questions, queries, Comments that anyone would like to make? Okay, I think thanks to both uh, Pavel and Rafaela for a very stimulating and um, session. Uh, not quite the way that I thought it was going to be stimulating, but it was it was certainly stimulating. Uh, thank you both. Much appreciated.